A Piece of Steak, a short story by Jack London. With the last morsel of bread, Tom King wiped his plate clean of the last particle of flour gravy and chewed the resulting mouthful in a slow and meditative way. When he arose from the table, he was oppressed by the feeling that he was distinctly hungry, yet he alone had eaten. The two children in the other room had been sent early to bed in order that in sleep they might forget they had gone supperless. His wife had touched nothing and had sat silently and watched him with solicitous eyes. She was a thin, worn woman of the working class, though signs of an earlier prettiness were not wanting in her face. The flour for the gravy she had borrowed from the neighbour across the hall. The last two happenies had gone to buy the bread. He sat down by the window on a rickety chair that protested under his weight, and quite mechanically he put his pipe in his mouth and dipped into the side pocket of his coat. The absence of any tobacco made him aware of his action, and, with a scowl for his forgetfulness, he put the pipe away. His movements were slow, almost hulking, as though he were burdened by the heavy weight of his muscles. He was a solid-bodied, stolid-looking man, and his appearance did not suffer from being over-prepossessing. His rough clothes were old and slouchy. The uppers of his shoes were too weak to carry the heavy resoling that was itself of no recent date, and his cotton shirt, a cheap two-shilling affair, showed a frayed collar and ineradicable paint stains. But it was Tom King's face that advertised him unmistakably for what he was. It was the face of a typical prize fighter, of one who had put in long years of service in the squared ring, and by that means developed and emphasised all the marks of the fighting beast. It was distinctly a lowering countenance, and that no feature of it might escape notice. It was clean-shaven. The lips were shapeless and constituted a mouth harsh to excess that was like a gash in his face. The jaw was aggressive, brutal, heavy. The eyes, slow of movement and heavy-lidded, were almost expressionless under the shaggy, indrawn brows. Sheer animal that he was, the eyes were the most animal-like feature about him. They were sleepy, lion-like, the eyes of a fighting animal. The forehead slanted quickly back to the hair, which, clipped close, showed every bump of a villainous-looking head. A nose twice broken and moulded variously by countless blows, and a cauliflower ear, permanently swollen and distorted to twice its size, completed his adornment, while the beard, fresh-shaven as it was, sprouted in the skin and gave the face a blue-black stain. Altogether, it was the face of a man to be afraid of in a dark alley or lonely place. And yet Tom King was not a criminal, nor had he ever done anything criminal. Outside of brawls, common to his walk in life, he had harmed no one, nor had he ever been known to pick a quarrel. He was a professional, and all the fighting brutishness of him was reserved for his professional appearances. Outside the ring he was slow-going, easy-natured, and, in his younger days, when money was flush, too open-handed for his own good. He bore no grudges and had few enemies. Fighting was a business with him. In the ring, he struck to hurt, struck to maim, struck to destroy, but there was no animus in it. It was a plain business proposition. Audiences assembled and paid for the spectacle of men knocking each other out. The winner took the big end of the purse. When Tom King faced the Wulamulu Gauga twenty years before, he knew that the Gauga's jaw was only four months healed after having been broken in a Newcastle bout, and he had played for that jaw and broken it again in the ninth round, not because he bore the Gauga any ill will, but because that was the surest way to put the Gauga out and win the big end of the purse. Nor had the Gauga borne him any ill will for it. It was the game, and both knew the game and played it. Tom King had never been a talker, and he sat by the window, morosely silent, staring at his hands. The veins stood out on the backs of the hands, large and swollen, and the knuckles, smashed and battered and malformed, testified to the use to which they had been put. He had never heard that a man's life was the life of his arteries, but well, he knew the meaning of those big, upstanding veins. His heart had pumped too much blood through them at top pressure. They no longer did the work. 
He had stretched the elasticity out of them, and with their distension had passed his endurance. He tired easily now. No longer could he do a fast twenty rounds, hammer and tongs, fight, 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 from gong to gong, with fierce rally on top of fierce rally, beaten to the ropes and in turn beating his opponent to the ropes and rallying fiercest and fastest of all in that last, twentieth round, with the house on its feet and yelling, himself rushing, striking, ducking, raining showers of blows upon showers of blows and receiving showers of blows in return, and all the time the heart faithfully pumping the surging blood through the adequate veins. The veins, swollen at the time, had always shrunk down again, though each time, imperceptibly at first, not quite, remaining just a trifle larger than before. He stared at them and at his battered knuckles, and for the moment caught a vision of the youthful excellence of those hands before the first knuckle had been smashed on the head of Benny Jones, otherwise known as the Welsh Terror. The impression of his hunger came back on him. Blimey, but couldn't I go a piece of steak, he muttered aloud, clenching his huge fists and spitting out a smothered oath. I tried both Burke's and Sawley's, his wife said half apologetically. And they wouldn't, he demanded. Not a happeny, Burke said. She faltered. Guan, what did he say? As how he was thinking Sandal you did do you tonight, and as how your score was comfortable big as it was. Tom King grunted, but did not reply. He was busy thinking of the bull terrier he had kept in his younger days, to which he had fed steaks without end. Burke would have given him credit for a thousand steaks, then. But times had changed. Tom King was a getting old, and old men, fighting before second-rate clubs, couldn't expect to run bills of any size with the tradesman. He had got up in the morning with a longing for a piece of steak, and the longing had not abated. He had not had a fair training for this fight. It was a drought year in Australia, times were hard, and even the most irregular work was difficult to find. He had had no sparring partner, and his food had not been of the best nor always sufficient. He had done a few days' navvy work when he could get it, and he had run around the domain in the early mornings to get his legs in shape. But it was hard, training without a partner and with a wife and two kiddies that must be fed. Credit with the tradesman had undergone very slight expansion when he was matched with Sandal. The secretary of the Gaiety Club had advanced him three pounds, the loser's end of the purse, and beyond that had refused to go. Now and again he had managed to borrow a few shillings from old pals who would have lent more only that it was a drought year and they were hard put themselves. No, and there was no use in disguising the fact. His training had not been satisfactory. He should have had better food and no worries. Besides, when a man is forty, it is harder to get into condition than when he is twenty. What time is it, Lizzie? he asked. His wife went across the hall to inquire and came back. Quarter before eight. D They'll be starting the first bout in a few minutes, he said. Only a try out. Then there's a four-round spar tween Dealer Wells and Gridley, and a ten-round go tween Starlight and some sailor bloke. I don't come on for over an hour. At the end of another silent ten minutes, he rose to his feet. Truth is, Lizzie, I ain't had proper training. He reached for his hat and started for the door. He did not offer to kiss her. He never did on going out, but on this night she dared to kiss him, throwing her arms around him and compelling him to bend down to her face. She looked quite small against the massive bulk of the man. Good luck, Tom, she said. You gotta do him. Aye, I gotta do him, he repeated. That's all there is to it. I just gotta do him. He laughed with an attempt at heartiness while she pressed more closely against him. Across her shoulders, he looked around the bare room. It was all he had in the world, with the rent overdue, and her and the kiddies. And he was leaving it to go out into the night to get meat for his mate and cubs, not like a modern working man going to his machine grind, but in the old, primitive, royal, animal way, by fighting for it. I gotta do him, he repeated, this time a hint of desperation in his voice. If it's a win, it's thirty quid, and I can pay all that's owing with a lump of money left over. If it's a lose, I get naught, 
Not even a penny for me to ride home on the tram. The secretaries give all that's coming from a loser's end. Goodbye, old woman. I'll come straight home if it's a win. And I'll be waiting up, she called to him along the hall. It was full two miles to the gaiety, and as he walked along, he remembered how in his palmy days he had once been the heavyweight champion of New South Wales, he would have ridden in a cab to the fight, and how most likely some heavy backer would have paid for the cab and ridden with him. There were Tommy Burns and that Yankee nigger, Jack Johnson. They rode about in motor cars, and he walked, and as any man knew, a hard two miles was not the best preliminary to a fight. He was an old un, and the world did not wag well with old uns. He was good for nothing now except navvy work, and his broken nose and swollen ear were against him even in that. He found himself wishing that he had learned a trade. It would have been better in the long run. But no one had told him, and he knew deep down in his heart that he would not have listened if they had. It had been so easy. Big money, sharp, glorious fights. Periods of rest and loafing in between, a following of eager flatterers, the slaps on the back, the shakes of the hand, the toffs glad to buy him a drink for the privilege of five minutes' talk, and the glory of it, the yelling houses, the whirlwind finish, the referees, king wins, and his name in the sporting columns next day. Those had been times. But he realised now, in his slow, ruminating way, that it was the old oons he had been putting away. He was youth, rising and they were age, sinking. No wonder it had been easy. They, with their swollen veins and battered knuckles and weary in the bones of them from the long battles they had already fought. He remembered the time he put out old Stosha Bill at Rushcutter's Bay in the 18th round, and how old Bill had cried afterward in the dressing room like a baby. Perhaps old Bill's rent had been overdue. Perhaps he'd had at home a missus and a couple of kiddies. And perhaps Bill, that very day of the fight, had had a hungering for a piece of steak. Bill had fought game and taken incredible punishment. He could see now, after he had gone through the mill himself, that Stosha Bill had fought for a bigger steak that night twenty years ago than had young Tom King, who had fought for glory and easy money. No wonder Stosha Bill had cried afterward in the dressing room. Well... A man had only so many fights in him to begin with. It was the iron law of the game. One man might have a hundred hard fights in him, another man only twenty. Each, according to the make of him and the quality of his fibre, had a definite number. And when he had fought them, he was done. Yes, he had had more fights in him than most of them, and he had had far more than his share of the hard, gruelling fights, the kind that worked the heart and lungs to bursting, that took the elastic out of the arteries and made hard knots of muscle out of youth's sleek suppleness, that wore out nerve and stamina and made brain and bones weary from excess of effort and endurance overwrought. Yes, he had done better than all of them. There were none of his old fighting partners left. He was the last of the old guard. He had seen them all finished, and he had had a hand in finishing some of them. They had tried him out against the old uns, and one after another he had put them away, laughing when, like old Stosha Bill, they cried in the dressing room. And now he was an old Uen, and they tried out the youngsters on him. There was that bloke, Sandal. He had come over from New Zealand with a record behind him, but nobody in Australia knew anything about him, so they put him up against old Tom King. If Sandal made a showing, he would be given better men to fight with bigger purses to win, so it was to be depended upon that he would put up a fierce battle. He had everything to win by it, money and glory and career, and Tom King was the grizzled old chopping block that guarded the highway to fame and fortune, and he had nothing to win except thirty quid to pay to the landlord and the tradesman. And as Tom King thus ruminated, there came to his stolid vision the form of youth, Glorious youth, rising exultant and invincible, supple of muscle and silken of skin, with heart and lungs that had never been tired and torn and that laughed at limitation of effort. Yes, youth was the nemesis. It destroyed the old uns and wrecked not that in so doing it destroyed itself. 
It enlarged its arteries and smashed its knuckles and was in turn destroyed by youth. For youth was ever youthful. It was only age that grew old. At Castlereagh Street, he turned to the left and three blocks along came to the gaiety. A crowd of young larrikins hanging outside the door made respectful way for him, and he heard one say to another, That's him. That's Tom King. Inside, on the way to his dressing room, he encountered the secretary, a keen-eyed, shrewd-faced young man who shook his hand. How are you feeling, Tom? he asked. Fit as a fiddle, King answered, though he knew that he lied, and that if he had a quid, he would give it right there for a good piece of steak. When he emerged from the dressing room, his seconds behind him, and came down the aisle to the squared ring in the centre of the hall, a burst of greeting and applause went up from the waiting crowd. He acknowledged salutations right and left, though few of the faces did he know. Most of them were the faces of kiddies unborn when he was winning his first laurels in the squared ring. He leaped lightly to the raised platform and ducked through the ropes to his corner where he sat down on a folding stool. Jack Ball, the referee, came over and shook his hand. Ball was a broken-down pugilist who for over ten years had not entered the ring as a principal. King was glad that he had him for referee. They were both old uns. If he should rough it with Sandal a bit beyond the rules, he knew Ball could be depended upon to pass it by. Aspiring young heavyweights, one after another, were climbing into the ring and being presented to the audience by the referee. Also, he issued their challenges for them. Young Pronto, Bill announced, from North Sydney, challenges the winner for £50 side bet. The audience applauded and applauded again as Sandell himself sprang through the ropes and sat down in his corner. Tom King looked across the ring at him curiously, for in a few minutes they would be locked together in merciless combat, each trying with all the force of him to knock the other into unconsciousness. But little could he see, for Sandal, like himself, had trousers and sweater on over his ring costume. His face was strongly handsome, crowned with a curly mop of yellow hair, while his thick, muscular neck hinted at bodily magnificence. Young Pronto went to one corner and then the other, shaking hands with the principals and dropping down out of the ring. The challenges went on. Ever youth climbed through the ropes, youth unknown but insatiable, crying out to mankind that with strength and skill it would match issues with the winner. A few years before, in his own heyday of invincibleness, Tom King would have been amused and bored by these preliminaries. But now he sat fascinated, unable to shake the vision of youth from his eyes. Always were these youngsters rising up in the boxing game, springing through the ropes and shouting their defiance, and always were the old uns going down before them. They climbed to success over the bodies of the old uns, and ever they came, more and more youngsters, youth unquenchable and irresistible, and ever they put the old uns away, themselves becoming old uns and travelling the same downward path, while behind them, ever pressing on them, was youth eternal, the new babies, grown lusty and dragging their elders down, with behind them more babies to the end of time. Youth that must have its will, and that will never die. King glanced over to the press box and nodded to Morgan, of the sportsman, and Corbett, of the referee. Then he held out his hands, while Sid Sullivan and Charlie Bates, his seconds, slipped on his gloves and laced them tight, closely watched by one of Sandell's seconds, who first examined critically the tapes on King's knuckles. A second of his own was in Sandell's corner, performing a like office. Sandell's trousers were pulled off, and as he stood up, his sweater was skinned off over his head. And Tom King, looking, saw youth incarnate, deep-chested, heavy-thewed, with muscles that slipped and slid like live things under the white satin skin. The whole body was a crawl with life, and Tom King knew that it was a life that had never oozed its freshness out through the aching pores during the long fights wherein youth paid its toll and departed not quite so young as when it entered. 
The two men advanced to meet each other, and as the gong sounded and the seconds clattered out of the ring with the folding stools, they shook hands and instantly took their fighting attitudes. And instantly, like a mechanism of steel and springs balanced on a hair trigger, Sandell was in and out and in again, landing a left to the eyes, a right to the ribs, ducking a counter, dancing lightly away and dancing menacingly back again. He was swift and clever. It was a dazzling exhibition. The house yelled its approbation. But King was not dazzled. He had fought too many fights and too many youngsters. He knew the blows for what they were, too quick and too deft to be dangerous. Evidently, Sandell was going to rush things from the start. It was to be expected. It was the way of youth, expending its splendor and excellence in wild insurgence and furious onslaught, overwhelming opposition with its own unlimited glory of strength and desire. Sandell was in and out, here, there, and everywhere light-footed and eager-hearted, a living wonder of white flesh and stinging muscle that wove itself into a dazzling fabric of attack, slipping and leaping like a flying shuttle from action to action through a thousand actions, all of them centred upon the destruction of Tom King, who stood between him and fortune. And Tom King patiently endured. He knew his business, and he knew youth now that youth was no longer his. There was nothing to do till the other lost some of his steam, was his thought, and he grinned to himself as he deliberately ducked so as to receive a heavy blow on the top of his head. It was a wicked thing to do, yet eminently fair according to the rules of the boxing game. A man was supposed to take care of his own knuckles, and if he insisted on hitting an opponent on the top of the head, he did so at his own peril. King could have ducked lower and let the blow whiz harmlessly past, but he remembered his own early fights and how he smashed his first knuckle on the head of the Welsh terror. He was but playing the game. That duck had accounted for one of Sandal's knuckles. Not that Sandal would mind it now. He would go on superbly regardless, hitting as hard as ever throughout the fight. But later on, when the long ring battles had begun to tell, he would regret that knuckle and look back and remember how he smashed it on Tom King's head. The first round was all Sandell's, and he had the house yelling with the rapidity of his whirlwind rushes. He overwhelmed King with avalanches of punches, and King did nothing. He never struck once, contenting himself with covering up, blocking and ducking and clinching to avoid punishment. He occasionally fainted, shook his head when the weight of a punch landed, and moved stolidly about, never leaping or springing or wasting an ounce of strength. Sandal must foam the froth of youth away before discreet age could dare to retaliate. All King's movements were slow and methodical, and his heavy-lidded, slow-moving eyes gave him the appearance of being half asleep or dazed. Yet they were eyes that saw everything, that had been trained to see everything through all his twenty years and odd in the ring. They were eyes that did not blink or waver before an impending blow, but that coolly saw and measured distance. Seated in his corner for the minute's rest at the end of the round, he lay back with outstretched legs, his arms resting on the right angle of the ropes, his chest and abdomen heaving frankly and deeply as he gulped down the air driven by the towels of his seconds. He listened with closed eyes to the voices of the house. Why don't you fight, Tom? Many were crying. You ain't afraid of him, are you? Muscle-bound, he heard a man on a front seat comment. He can't move quicker. Two to one on Sandal, in quids. The gong struck, and the two men advanced from their corners. Sandel came forward fully three quarters of the distance, eager to begin again. But King was content to advance the shorter distance. It was in line with his policy of economy. He had not been well trained, and he had not had enough to eat, and every step counted. Besides, he had already walked two miles to the ringside. It was a repetition of the first round, with Sandal attacking like a whirlwind, and with the audience indignantly demanding why King did not fight. Beyond fainting, and several slowly delivered and ineffectual blows, he did nothing save block and stall and clinch. Sandal wanted to make the pace fast, 
while King, out of his wisdom, refused to accommodate him. He grinned with a certain wistful pathos in his ring-battered countenance and went on cherishing his strength with the jealousy of which only age is capable. Sandal was youth, and he threw his strength away with the munificent abandon of youth. To King belonged the ring generalship, the wisdom bred of long, aching fights. He watched with cool eyes and head, moving slowly and waiting for Sandell's froth to foam away. To the majority of the onlookers, it seemed as though King was hopelessly outclassed, and they voiced their opinion in offers of three to one on Sandell. But there were wise ones, a few, who knew King of old time, and who covered what they considered easy money. The third round began as usual, one-sided, with Sandal doing all the leading and delivering all the punishment. A half minute had passed when Sandal, overconfident, left an opening. King's eyes and right arm flashed in the same instant. It was his first real blow, a hook with the twisted arch of the arm to make it rigid, and with all the weight of the half-pivoted body behind it. It was like a sleepy-seeming lion suddenly thrusting out a lightning paw. Sandal, caught on the side of the jaw, was felled like a bullock. The audience gasped and murmured awe-stricken applause. The man was not muscle-bound, after all, and he could drive a blow like a trip hammer. Sandal was shaken. He rolled over and attempted to rise, but the sharp yells from his seconds to take the count restrained him. He knelt on one knee, ready to rise, and waited, while the referee stood over him, counting the seconds loudly in his ear. At the ninth, he rose in fighting attitude, and Tom King, facing him, knew regret that the blow had not been an inch nearer the point of the jaw. That would have been a knockout, and he could have carried the thirty quid home to the missus and the kiddies. The round continued to the end of its three minutes, Sandal for the first time respectful of his opponent, and King slow of movement and sleepy-eyed as ever. As the round neared its close, King, warned of the fact by sight of the seconds crouching outside ready for the spring in through the ropes, worked the fight around to his own corner. And when the gong struck, he sat down immediately on the waiting stool, while Sandal had to walk all the way across the diagonal of the square to his own corner. It was a little thing, but it was the sum of little things that counted. Sandal was compelled to walk that many more steps, to give up that much energy, and to lose a part of the precious minute of rest. At the beginning of every round, King loafed slowly out from his corner, forcing his opponent to advance the greater distance. The end of every round found the fight manoeuvred by King into his own corner so that he could immediately sit down. Two more rounds went by, in which King was parsimonious of effort and Sandal prodigal. The latter's attempt to force a fast pace made King uncomfortable, for a fair percentage of the multitudinous blows showered upon him went home, yet King persisted in his dogged slowness, despite the crying of the young hotheads for him to go in and fight. Again, in the sixth round, Sandal was careless. Again, Tom King's fearful right flashed out to the jaw, and again Sandell took the nine seconds count. By the seventh round, Sandell's pink of condition was gone, and he settled down to what he knew was to be the hardest fight in his experience. Tom King was an old Uen, but a better old Un than he had ever encountered, an old Un who never lost his head, who was remarkably able at defence, whose blows had the impact of a knotted club, and who had a knockout in either hand. Nevertheless, Tom King dared not hit often. He never forgot his battered knuckles, and knew that every hit must count if the knuckles were to last out the fight. As he sat in his corner, glancing across at his opponent, the thought came to him that the sum of his wisdom and Sandell's youth would constitute a world's champion heavyweight. But that was the trouble. Sandell would never become a world champion. He lacked the wisdom, and the only way for him to get it was to buy it with youth. And when wisdom was his, youth would have been spent in buying it. King took every advantage he knew. He never missed an opportunity to clinch, and in effecting most of the clinches, his shoulder drove stiffly into the other's ribs. In the philosophy of the ring, a shoulder was as good as a punch so far as damage was concerned, and a great deal better so far as concerned expenditure of effort. 
Also, in the clinches, King rested his weight on his opponent and was loath to let go. This compelled the interference of the referee, who tore them apart, always assisted by Sandal, who had not yet learned to rest. He could not refrain from using those glorious flying arms and writhing muscles of his, and when the other rushed into a clinch, striking shoulder against ribs, and with head resting under Sandal's left arm, Sandal almost invariably swung his right behind his own back and into the projecting face. It was a clever stroke, much admired by the audience, but it was not dangerous, and was, therefore, just that much wasted strength. But Sandal was tireless and unaware of limitations, and King grinned and doggedly endured. Sandal developed a fierce right to the body, which made it appear that King was taking an enormous amount of punishment, and it was only the old ringsters who appreciated the deft touch of King's left glove to the other's biceps just before the impact of the blow. It was true, the blow landed each time, but each time it was robbed of its power by that touch on the biceps. In the ninth round, three times inside a minute, King's right hooked its twisted arch to the jaw, and three times Sandel's body, heavy as it was, was leveled to the mat. Each time he took the nine seconds allowed him and rose to his feet, shaken and jarred, but still strong. He had lost much of his speed, and he wasted less effort. He was fighting grimly, but he continued to draw upon his chief asset, which was youth. King's chief asset was experience. As his vitality had dimmed and his vigour abated, he had replaced them with cunning, with wisdom born of the long fights and with a careful shepherding of strength. Not alone had he learned never to make a superfluous movement, but he had learned how to seduce an opponent into throwing his strength away. Again and again, by feint of foot and hand and body, he continued to inveigle Sandal into leaping back, ducking or countering. King rested, but he never permitted Sandal to rest. It was the strategy of age. Early in the tenth round, King began stopping the other's rushes with straight lefts to the face, and Sandal, grown wary, responded by drawing the left, then by ducking it and delivering his right in a swinging hook to the side of the head. It was too high up to be vitally effective, but when first it landed, King knew the old, familiar descent of the black veil of unconsciousness across his mind. For the instant, or for the slyest fraction of an instant, rather, he ceased. In the one moment, he saw his opponent ducking out of his field of vision and the background of white, watching faces. In the next moment, he again saw his opponent and the background of faces. It was as if he had slept for a time and just opened his eyes again. And yet the interval of unconsciousness was so microscopically short that there had been no time for him to fall. The audience saw him totter and his knees give, and then saw him recover and tuck his chin deeper into the shelter of his left shoulder. Several times Sandel repeated the blow, keeping King partially dazed, and then the latter worked out his defence, which was also a counter. Fighting with his left, he took a half-step backward, at the same time uppercutting with the whole strength of his right. So accurately was it timed that it landed squarely on Sandel's face, in the full downward sweep of the duck, and Sandal lifted in the air and curled backward, striking the mat on his head and shoulders. Twice King achieved this, then turned loose and hammered his opponent to the ropes. He gave Sandel no chance to rest or to set himself, but smashed blow in upon blow till the house rose to its feet and the air was filled with an unbroken roar of applause. But Sandel's strength and endurance were superb, and he continued to stay on his feet. A knockout seemed certain, and a captain of police, appalled at the dreadful punishment, arose by the ringside to stop the fight. The gong struck for the end of the round, and Sandel staggered to his corner, protesting to the captain that he was sound and strong. To prove it, he threw two back air springs, and the police captain gave in. Tom King, leaning back in his corner and breathing hard, was disappointed. If the fight had been stopped, the referee, perforce, would have rendered him the decision, and the purse would have been his. Unlike Sandel, he was not fighting for glory or career, but for thirty quid. 
and now Sandel would recuperate in the minute of rest. Youth will be served, this saying flashed into King's mind, and he remembered the first time he had heard it, the night when he had put away Stosher Bill. The toff who had bought him a drink after the fight and patted him on the shoulder had used those words. Youth will be served. The toff was right, and on that night in the long ago, he had been youth. Tonight, youth sat in the opposite corner. As for himself, he had been fighting for half an hour now, and he was an old man. Had he fought like Sandal, he would not have lasted fifteen minutes. But the point was that he did not recuperate. Those upstanding arteries and that sorely tried heart would not enable him to gather strength in the intervals between the rounds, and he had not had sufficient strength in him to begin with. His legs were heavy under him and beginning to cramp. He should not have walked those two miles to the fight, and there was the stake which he had got up longing for that morning. A great and terrible hatred rose up in him for the butchers who had refused him credit. It was hard for an old man to go into a fight without enough to eat, and a piece of steak was such a little thing, a few pennies at best, yet it meant thirty quid to him. With the gong that opened the eleventh round, Sandal rushed, making a show of freshness which he did not really possess. King knew it for what it was, a bluff as old as the game itself. He clinched to save himself, then, going free, allowed Sandal to get set. This was what King desired. He feinted with his left, drew the answering duck and swinging upward hook, then made the half step backward, delivered the uppercut full to the face and crumpled Sandal over to the mat. After that, he never let him rest, receiving punishment himself, but inflicting far more, smashing Sandal to the ropes, hooking and driving all manner of blows into him, tearing away from his clinches or punching him out of attempted clinches, and ever when Sandal would have fallen, catching him with one uplifting hand and with the other immediately smashing him into the ropes where he could not fall. The house by this time had gone mad, and it was his house, nearly every voice yelling, Go it, Tom! Get him! Get him! You've got him, Tom! You've got him! It was to be a whirlwind finish, and that was what a ringside audience paid to see and Tom King, who for half an hour had conserved his strength, now expended it prodigally in the one great effort he knew he had in him. It was his one chance, now or not at all. His strength was waning fast, and his hope was that before the last of it ebbed out of him, he would have beaten his opponent down for the count. And as he continued to strike and force, coolly estimating the weight of his blows and the quality of the damage wrought, he realized how hard a man's sandal was to knock out. Stamina and endurance were his to an extreme degree, and they were the virgin stamina and endurance of youth. Sandal was certainly a coming man. He had it in him. Only out of such rugged fibre were successful fighters fashioned. Sandel was reeling and staggering, but Tom King's legs were cramping and his knuckles going back on him. Yet he steeled himself to strike the fierce blows, every one of which brought anguish to his tortured hands. Though now he was receiving practically no punishment, he was weakening as rapidly as the other. His blows went home, but there was no longer the weight behind them, and each blow was the result of a severe effort of will. His legs were like lead, and they dragged visibly under him, while Sandel's backers, cheered by this symptom, began calling encouragement to their man. King was spurred to a burst of effort. He delivered two blows in succession, a left, a trifle too high, to the solar plexus, and a right cross to the jaw. They were not heavy blows, yet so weak and dazed was Sandel that he went down and lay quivering. The referee stood over him, shouting the count of the fatal seconds in his ear. If before the tenth second was called, he did not rise. The fight was lost. The house stood in hushed silence. King rested on trembling legs. A mortal dizziness was upon him, and before his eyes the sea of faces sagged and swayed, while to his ears, as from a remote distance, came the count of the referee. Yet he looked upon the fight as his. It was impossible that a man so punished could rise. Only youth could rise and Sandal rose. At the fourth second, he rolled over on his face and groped blindly for the ropes. 
By the seventh second, he had dragged himself to his knee where he rested, his head rolling groggily on his shoulders. As the referee cried, Nine! Sandel stood upright, in proper stalling position, his left arm wrapped about his face, his right wrapped about his stomach. Thus were his vital points guarded, while he lurched forward toward King in the hope of effecting a clinch and gaining more time. At the instant Sandel arose, King was at him, but the two blows he delivered were muffled on the stalled arms. The next moment Sandel was in the clinch and holding on desperately while the referee strove to drag the two men apart. King helped to force himself free. He knew the rapidity with which youth recovered, and he knew that Sandal was his if he could prevent that recovery. One stiff punch would do it. Sandal was his, indubitably his. He had outgeneraled him, outfought him, outpointed him. Sandal reeled out of the clinch, balanced on the hairline between defeat or survival. One good blow would topple him over and down and out. And Tom King, in a flash of bitterness, remembered the piece of steak and wished that he had it then behind that necessary punch he must deliver. He nerved himself for the blow, but it was not heavy enough nor swift enough. Sandal swayed, but did not fall, staggering back to the ropes and holding on. King staggered after him, and with a pang like that of dissolution, delivered another blow. But his body had deserted him. All that was left of him was a fighting intelligence that was dimmed and clouded from exhaustion. The blow that was aimed for the jaw struck no higher than the shoulder. He had willed the blow higher, but the tired muscles had not been able to obey. And from the impact of the blow, Tom King himself reeled back and nearly fell. Once again he strove. This time his punch missed altogether, and from absolute weakness, he fell against Sandal and clinched, holding on to him to save himself from sinking to the floor. King did not attempt to free himself. He had shot his bolt. He was gone, and youth had been served. Even in the clinch he could feel Sandal growing stronger against him. When the referee thrust them apart, there, before his eyes, he saw youth recuperate. From instant to instant, Sandal grew stronger. His punches, weak and futile at first, became stiff and accurate. Tom King's bleared eyes saw the gloved fist driving at his jaw, and he willed to guard it by interposing his arm. He saw the danger, willed the act, but the arm was too heavy. It seemed burdened with a hundred weight of lead. It would not lift itself, and he strove to lift it with his soul. Then the gloved fist landed home. He experienced a sharp snap that was like an electric spark, and simultaneously the veil of blackness enveloped him. When he opened his eyes again, he was in his corner, and he heard the yelling of the audience like the roar of the surf at Bondi Beach. A wet sponge was being pressed against the base of his brain, and Sid Sullivan was blowing cold water in a refreshing spray over his face and chest. His gloves had already been removed, and Sandal, bending over him, was shaking his hand. He bore no ill will toward the man who had put him out, and he returned the grip with a heartiness that made his battered knuckles protest. Then Sandel stepped to the centre of the ring, and the audience hushed its pandemonium to hear him accept young Pronto's challenge and offer to increase the side bet to one hundred pounds. King looked on apathetically, while his seconds mopped the streaming water from him, dried his face, and prepared him to leave the ring. He felt hungry. It was not the ordinary, gnawing kind, but a great faintness, a palpitation at the pit of the stomach that communicated itself to all his body. He remembered back into the fight, to the moment when he had Sandal swaying and tottering on the hairline balance of defeat. Ah, that piece of steak would have done it. He had lacked just that for the decisive blow, and he had lost. It was all because of the piece of steak. His seconds were half supporting him as they helped him through the ropes. He tore free from them, ducked through the ropes unaided, and leaped heavily to the floor, following on their heels as they forced a passage for him down the crowded centre aisle. Now, leaving the dressing room for the street in the entrance to the hall, some young fellow spoke to him. We didn't you go in and get him when you had him? the young fellow asked. 
Oh, go to hell, said Tom King, and passed down the steps to the sidewalk. The doors of the public house at the corner were swinging wide, and he saw the lights and the smiling barmaids, heard the many voices discussing the fight and the prosperous chink of money on the bar. Somebody called to him to have a drink. He hesitated perceptibly, then refused and went on his way. He had not a copper in his pocket, and the two-mile walk home seemed very long. He was certainly getting old. Crossing the domain, he sat down suddenly on a bench, unnerved by the thought of the missus sitting up for him, waiting to learn the outcomes of the fight. That was harder than any knockout, and it seemed almost impossible to face. He felt weak and sore, and the pain of his smashed knuckles warned him that, even if he could find a job at navvy work, it would be a week before he could grip a pick handle or a shovel. The hunger palpitation at the pit of the stomach was sickening. His wretchedness overwhelmed him, and into his eyes came an unwonted moisture. He covered his face with his hands, and as he cried, he remembered Stosha Bill and how he had served him that night in the long ago. Poor old Stosha Bill. He could understand now why Bill had cried in the dressing room.